Welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, in an almost 60 year career, oh, that's a lot. Um, uh, Peter Rosnos has seen it all. As a reporter for the Washington Post for almost 18 years, he was a foreign correspondent in Vietnam, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. And then as a publisher and editor with uh, Random House and then Public Affairs, which he did for 35 years. Along the way, he published four presidents, Bob McNamara, Magic Johnson, Paul Volcker, George Soros, Saransky, and dozens and dozens of other luminaries. The title of his new book, An Especially Good View, has it right. He has not only watched history happen, he is part of that history, having met the players, having been in the game. Quite a ride, Mr. Osnos. Thank you, Roxanne. So as, just so that everybody um, uh, knows this, Peter and I have been friends for 30 years, so this might not be the most unbiased um, interview, but we're both honest people, so it'll be as unbiased as a you could be with a friend of uh, 30 years. So Peter, you, you read your book, and there's, you know, what has to be viewed as a lot of glamorous uh, inter intersections with world events, with an extraordinary array of people. But the story um, doesn't begin in a glamorous world. It in fact begins in horrific circumstances uh, in the, in the midst of World War II and the Holocaust and your parents are there as Polish um, Jews, not in the best uh, set of circumstances. So what was a little bit of their story and what did that set of circumstances, how did that inform you? Um, well, so first of all, let's start with say, that. I just want to say to whoever may be watching here that I am uh, flattered, if not honored, to be being interviewed by Roxanne Cody, who is, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, one of the truly great booksellers in this country and has been, not for 60 years like I have been, but for certainly a long time. So Roxanne, yeah. this. Well, the, answer to the, question, the answer to the question is, is that the origin of the book, in a sense, was my grandson, Ben, was a teenager saying to me, tell me the story of your family in World War II. And I said, Ben, it's our family. And I realized that the reality is that my grandson and my eventually great grandsons and daughters, they won't know the story unless I capture it. I knew the legends because you do. But what I did was I set out to re-report the story. Um, we went to Poland, Susan and I, my wife and I. We went to Poland. We went to India, where my parents spent the war. And, and where, I, war. where I was born. Uh, I went to, we went back to Southeast Asia, to Cambodia, um, to, to kind of measure how things had changed. So what I was doing here was the first half, roughly, of their lives took place before I was born. Yeah. I left India in a basket. They got on a troop ship, December 31st, 1943. I was in a basket. They got to San Pedro, California after 40 days on the water in the height of the war. They took a train to New York and they started over. And I always felt that because of that, I had to be, I was a, essentially an observer from the start. I, I say that we were strangers really with the same DNA mm. because my entire life took place here in the culture of America and the realities of America whereas they were very much shaped by their European tradition and history. These were not shuttle Jews. I mean, these were not people who came out of the country. This was a very sort of old school, distinguished family of a certain kind. Uh, you, don't, you didn't assimilate in Poland, you acculturated. So they had their own identity as significant people, but they were not assimilated. They had a good life there. Uh, they had lived in France. My brother was born in France and all of it was gone. Yeah. All of it. And they had to start over again. And so I was, from the beginning, an observer. 
which is why the book has the sort of framework that it does, because I started really from the beginning observing. And all along the way, as I went through my various professional stuff, I was continuing to observe. Mm -hmm. uh, I was present, and in some cases, very deeply engaged, but always at some level an observer, which is why I chose the title that I did. And I like to quote the real quote from Yogi Berra, which is, you can observe a lot by watching. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Peter, the, the thing that I'm always uh, fascinated by is how parents' experiences in, in form ours. And your parents, like my parents, who were also Holocaust survivors, but as opposed to your parents, they did not come from uh, great circumstances in Europe and nonetheless achieved uh, success here. But there was a little fact in your book that I, I want to unpack for a minute because I wonder how that informed you and how it represented who your parents were. So you talk about that your parents sent you to sleepaway camp <laughs> in Hunter, New York for uh -huh. eight weeks yep. in the summer before your fourth birthday. So yep. either what was that about or what do you remember about that? Because that well, seemed- I like remember a, nothing. I remember little, nothing. It's uh, shocking. Well, I'll explain it. I explain it. And it, there, again, there's a thread. Here. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. The thread is that, well, first of all, they, my mother was a biochemist, a uh, scientist. She was at, at, at uh, Columbia Physicians and Surgeons for her, virtually her entire career. Uh, my father obviously was getting himself together and starting a, a, a business, which he did, and which, curiously, after all these years, it still exists, although he's long gone. Uh, I, I just don't think they knew what to do. I honestly don't think they knew what to yeah. do. They... Uh, so they put me on a bus and um, the only thing I was told was that when they came to visit, I wouldn't talk to them. But, you know, I don't think I'm, you know, the scars. I'd say that they were European parents. They were the opposite of helicopter parents. Yeah, yeah. Meaning they, it's not that they weren't devoted. They were devoted. They just had to basically deal with their own lives and allowed me or expected me to deal with mine. And that was true the whole time. Yeah. And I, one of the other theme of the book is an important theme of the book is, and the more I talk about it, the more clear it becomes to me, is that is something called deflection, which is that when you have an intense emotional experience of some kind or another, sometimes you don't realize you're having it. You just park it. Yeah. And I have a feeling that there was a lot of that in my parents' lives which is that they didn't dwell. Certainly my brother, who was eight when the Nazis got into Warsaw, 12 when he got off the boat in California, he lived through, you know, as, a, as, a, as a young, as a child, <clears throat> some of the most intense experiences somebody could ever have. And he never talked about it. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he? He didn't not talk about it as a matter of principle. He would say, look, I'm not a victim. I'm here. And now I'm getting on with it. And my parents were the same way. So I think in, you know, I never thought that they were, that they were, you know, not Perfect. interested. They were interested, but in their way and fitting their circumstances. Last point on this. In India, after they were there about 18 months, my brother Wright was maybe 10. He was sent off to a boarding school in the hills, a couple of three hours from Bombay because that's what they needed to do for him. And he went to a school, which by the way, most famous graduate was Freddie Mercury of Queen, very big deal. <laughs> but uh, when I asked my brothers, actually shortly before he died, he, he died last year, he was 88. And I said, so Robert, why do you think they sent you to boarding school? He said, because they thought it was convenient. And I went to boarding school at 14 also. So there's a pattern here. I never resented it. Probably I wasn't happy when I was sent away when I was three, but I, I'm an axe murderer, so it wasn't all that serious. Yeah, well, and you know, one of the things 
uh, Peter to tie, you know, I had parents who were Holocaust survivors and they each chose to deal with it in a different way. My mother like did what you're talking about. She compartmentalized it. She was gonna give up the highs and not worry about the lows. And that's, she operated down the line. My father had the range from rage to joy, but neither one of them considered themselves victims because even though they lost everybody, they, they were alive. Yeah, you know, when in the reporting for this book, we went to Poland, as I said, and I went to Auschwitz. I'd been there twice before, but this is my third visit. I've never been there, and my mother was in Auschwitz. Well, then you will. I have to go. go. Auschwitz, you know, I, the first time I went there was in 1966. It's rather a very different place now. It's it's got, it's not quite a theme park. Yeah, but, but we, the museum. We did have a lunch in the Auschwitz, Auschwitz Cafe. <laughs> Um, but there are scrolls in it of everybody's name who perished. And I had never seen the scrolls before. And I went through the scrolls and I found 19 people who had the Osnos name. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know that they were all relatives because the Osnos name was not unique. But 19 people with my name are on the scrolls at Auschwitz. And my mother's family, there were eight. So that's a lot of folks. Yeah. And so you cannot step away from that and say it didn't happen. Obviously it happened. And now it's one lifetime away, mine, as it happens. Yeah. And we need to really understand what were the consequences for people like us, you and me, of having been through a period after the Holocaust in which we're trying to understand what it really meant and what it was that was the impact on us. And in my case, trying to impart a bit of that to my offspring and grandchildren and so on. I don't want them, because their lives have been what they are, I don't want them to lose sight of what their ancestors and immediate ancestors went through and how they came out of it. It's not that they were victims. It's that they endured and their resilience. And they were and resilient. Look, I'm very, very proud of them in a way that I couldn't possibly have been before. Yeah, I my, my take and experience or view of looking at my parents is very similar, I think, to yours. So Peter, one of the, one of the lenses I wanna go through this conversation with is about the people, because although there's an enormous amount of history here, you have known just a shocking <laughs> I, I, you know, it's almost like, be, yeah, I was surprised there wasn't an index. Um, well, there's deliberately no index because I learned this lesson that if there's an index, people who are named will go to the index. Themselves up. Yeah, let them read the damn book. Let them um, read the damn book. So, but, but you did publish four presidents. Jimmy Carter, right. Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and right. Donald Trump. Right. And so when you publish someone's book, that's a pretty intimate relationship. So I'm curious if in kind of a thumbnail way, you could uh, share with us like their, what you observed is their outstanding weakness or their outstanding strength or the thing that just stunned you about any one of them. Well, I, I will do that. And the, but the thing is that why it was, I was not a, you know, distant, remote figure who just released the book. In all of these cases, I engaged in the case of Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump uh, really deeply. And in the case of Barack and Bill Clinton, close enough to have opinions. So I'll go through it very quickly. Yeah. Carter was the first one and he had left the White House. He had lost the presidency. He was back in planes. Peanut Farm was in financial trouble. Ro uh, Rosalind was, was, uh, had all the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. And he wanted to write a book. He'd written his presidential memoir. And he wanted to write a book about how do you take advantage of the rest of your life with Rosalind. And I'll get very quickly through the fact that what I saw was, and I believe to be the case, a completely authentic human being, in, in mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter. 
I, you know, sat at his kitchen table with Rosalind and he holding hands and saying grace, uh, which he knew better than I did. But, you know, subsequently, <laughs> the story about that book, which was called Everything to Gain, Making the Most of the Rest of Your Life, was that they tried to write it together. They couldn't. And I thought that he was kidding when he said it was the worst moment in their marriage. But he kept saying it enough so that I finally believed him. And what I did was I got, he would write a paragraph that had J, she would have a paragraph that said R, and in the acknowledgments he said an editor came down from New York and saved their marriage. Jimmy Carter was what he was. This was a man who wrote every word of 21 books. I published, believe it or not, a book of his poetry and a kid's book. And that was how he kind of paid the rent. Uh, authentic, real, no question, Jimmy was what he was. Bill Clinton, I did two books with him. One was a, a you know, the campaign manifesto in 1992, which was just a, taking a document, making it whole and sending it out and it was a great success. The second book was a book we did in 96 when he was running for re-election. Somehow we kept it secret. So when it was announced, people were stunned that Bill Clinton had written a book and it got tons, hundreds of thousands of orders. I knew it wasn't very interesting. So what I say about Bill Clinton is he's extraordinary. He's a charismatic, man, brilliant and so on. Very hard to, to, to sort of corral. Very mm -hmm. hard to get to focus unless he really wants to. Undisciplined, uh, would you say? I would say he was, he, he was, undisciplined would be wrong because he was disciplined enough to get the job done, but corralling him was hard. I mean, mm -hmm. we were fighting to get the last pages literally up to the final minute. And then the press is put in roll because he hadn't sent in the dedication. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Now, and then Barack. What happened with Barack was he had graduated, he was at Harvard uh, uh, Law School where he was president of the Law Review and, and everybody was very impressed with the fact that he was the first African-American person of color to be the president. He got a contract with Simon & Schuster for $125,000, which I always said was to pay his loans. And he missed the deadline. They canceled the book. And the agent called me and said, well, you know, he, he, he got to pay back $40,000, which you give him $40,000. So we did. I met with him came to the office, he was, I was very impressed with his kind of focus and cool. When he was inaugurated 10 years later, nine years later, when he gave a keynote speech, the book, same book that we had published in 1995, dusted off, sold four million copies. Wow. So I pulled a team together that had worked on the book on inauguration day. And I said, you know, it's a piece of history. We did this book in 1995 and here we are in 2009, and look what he is. And I said, what do we remember? And the consensus was we wish we remembered more because we would have more anecdotes if he was more trouble. But once we got a hold of him, he was extraordinarily kind of focused. He and wrote a beautiful book. It's a no it's question. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful writer. Beautiful book. And he wrote it in his 30s as a very young man. Yeah. And said with some pride that we enabled him to write it. So that was that. Donald and Trump. Peter, well, excuse me. Would you have been surprised that he would become a politician or the kind of president that he well, was? Well, frankly, you know, Roxanne, I don't know why. And this, I guess, is, is something that helps in the line of work I'm in. I just had an instinct about this guy from the minute I read that piece about him being the president of the Harvard Law Review. I was not surprised that he became a significant public figure. Obviously, president is one thing. But this was a man who you met and sat with. I only was with him for you know an hour or two, but I knew his presence. I understood the cool, the intellectual nature of it. He wasn't warm and fuzzy. It wasn't the thing, but you could tell that this was a guy with depth. And you know, each one of these three, remember, these were presidents of the United States. Yeah. So you do not get to be the president of the United States by being just another guy. They were all a person. They were all in their own way unique. But one of the lessons that I learned over these many, many years, when you're working with somebody up close, you are reminded that we all put them on one leg at a time. Mm -hmm. They're all, it's a wonderful story I like to say, and just Jimmy Carter story very quickly. When my son Evan, who was a teenager, and I was doing a book with, with Carter, and we were going to, a, to a, a, an event. And I was in the back seat of the car and 
Carter was at one side and Evan was in the middle and I was on the other side and the Secret Service was in front. And we were talking about the debates and so on. And Evan is sitting there straight ahead, straight ahead. And we get to the destination. I said, Evan, why were you, you know, so immobilized? He said, well, if I had turned towards him, it's a tight little car, I would have, my nose is, and his nose would have touched. <laughs> you got to remember that we're all people. Yeah. And you don't, even if you're a president of the United States, you're a person. And that was very helpful to me as an attitude that I kind of never was really intimidated. Yeah. And Trump, very briefly, because in a way, that's the most controversial thing I've ever done. And the one in which I really had the least responsibility for. Uh, I had just arrived at Random House. Cy Newhouse was the owner of Random House. His best friend was Roy Cohn, the New York lawyer. Roy Cohn said, this Trump guy's a, is a comer. Uh, Cy put him on the cover of GQ, it sold like crazy. He said, I want to do a book with the guy. And I was tasked to go and do it. And I did two books with him. Uh, and when people say, well, what did you see? My answer is always, I saw then the man who we eventually saw as president, but he was a developer. He has certain characteristics that are really powerful. People make the mistake of thinking he's a, a, a schmo. He's, or whatever but he is incredibly disciplined. Doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, lives over the store, whether it was Trump Tower or the White House. Doesn't go anywhere that doesn't have his name on it unless it's a political rally. And is only ultimately interested in himself and his future or his, the resonance of his life. And when he was a developer, that wasn't all that significant. But when he was the president, of course it was. And the point about this is that a year or so after we published the book, which, by the way, Roxanne, this is before you started the story, sold a million copies in three months. Incredible bestseller. I mean, just one of the major. And a year, 18 months later, I found myself unexpectedly in Atlantic City at a professional wrestling match, uh, Hulk Hogan type of thing. And 18,000 people. This is before The Apprentice. This is just after the book, before The Apprentice. Trump comes in there and 18,000 wrestling fans go crazy with enthusiasm. So when he became a candidate for president, I knew that this is a guy who reaches a certain, well, a certain community, a population of people in a unique way. And I think that we made a, as a nation, the idea that we, you know, it's not a serious candidate or anything, terrible mistake. I think one of the great political mistakes of modern times was underestimating Donald Trump. This is a guy who has a very powerful force. And we don't know what will happen to him now, but he was what he was. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I knew him. Kevin and I lived in New York in those days. Kevin was in the real estate business. I did, uh, I had a lot of real estate clients uh, at doing, uh, tax work. And I mean, people considered him a bad guy, an unreliable kind of a guy, even in the real estate field in the 80s. Yeah, but that's true. And yet, this is a guy who was in real estate, construction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Camp, boxing, wrestling, beauty contests in New York for 40 years and was never the target of a criminal investigation. That requires navigation. Yeah, I mean, that's Fires brilliant. A certain kind of, you know, I, you know, how to characterize, what's the right word? The truth is he was much more than people understood. Yeah. And they didn't like what they saw, but there were a lot of people who did. Well, you, you 75 know, million of them voted. Even then, Peter, because, you know, he he put himself together as a rock star and people responded to it, even when he was a rock star developer doing, you know, the Continental Hotel. Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's a it's a cliche. It's a truism to compare him to sort of people who like him in the past, meaning people who have a kind of appeal, mass appeal that is not positive. Yeah. And with names. The fact is that in this second election, the country knowing who he was and 
behavior and his style and all this other stuff, he still got 75 million yeah, votes. Yeah, I know. This is a man who was impeached not once, but twice and yeah. walked away. This was a man, the Mueller probe went on for three years and at the end, it was a fizzle. Trump lost the election in 2016 by 3 million votes and was inaugurated. The truth is, the metaphor of this guy's life is defying all kinds of weird odds. Why do I look back on it now as an experience of consequence? Because I didn't work for him. I didn't take money from him. I mean, yeah. ran, I paid him money. I got to see him up close. So when I say I have an opinion, it's based on experience. Yeah. One of the parts of the book um, that I was almost the most fascinated by, uh, Peter, was your time in the Soviet Union, in Moscow, and, and really your continued engagement in Russia. So, and in fact, didn't you even publish a little uh, self-portrait of Putin? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so here's, here's my series of questions about uh, your time there. One is, um, what was your take on Putin? Two is, how did you view contemporaneously the threat of the Soviet Union then? And what's your view of the threat of Putin and Russia today? Well, let me start by saying that you could take communism out of Russia, but you can't take the Russians out of Russia. Yeah. What you're seeing is a, a Russian leader in the tradition of Russian czars. They have a word for it, Bush leader. And, um, and you know, he's now been in office longer than Stalin. Uh, how did I encounter him? I was already involved. This, at first, I was a correspondent there for three years and had a lot of experience there. That's a whole story. I did two books with Boris Yeltsin. I did uh, Dabrinin, who was the American the Soviet ambassador in, in Washington for 30 years. Fascinating book. Sharansky. And Sharansky, I've done four books with a completely different story. I worked on Sakharov's memoirs. I had a tremendously kind of um, vivid sense of the place. And what happened was when, when Yeltsin retired, he essentially named Putin. I mean, there had to be some sort of formalities. And when I asked Yeltsin why he chose Putin, he says, because I thought he was tough enough to do this. And the other guys who wanted to re you know, replace me, they would all sort of tug their forelock. I didn't think they had the spine. I thought he had the spine. Well, he wasn't wrong on that. So what happened was his, after he took over first as prime minister and then president, they came to me, one of his, his representatives came to me and said, you know, we would like to introduce Putin to the world. So should he write a book? And I was in Moscow and I said, no, I don't think he should write a book because um, everybody will know he didn't write it. <laughs> so I said, why don't you get three of the, uh, you know, there was a period after the fall of the Soviet Union in which journalism in this Russia was real. I mean, there were real newspapers, magazines and so forth. So I said, get three of the leading journalists in uh, Russia at that time to sit down with him for extensive interviews. And that's what happened. He, he did 24 hours of interviews with these three people. And that was turned into a book called First Person. And if you read the book now, you can see that he was spinning us a bit. I mean, he talked how much devoted he was to his wife and children. Well, he left his wife and married a, a ice skater. Um, you know, he talked about his integrity and we know that that's questionable. But we did get a portrait of a, of a, of a man who was clear in his head uh, what he wanted to be. And when I met him, which was only once, I saw a guy who was really tough. It was right after a Soviet, a Russian submarine had, uh, had sunk and everybody, 200 sailors were gone. And I said, well, God, you know, that's really so, you know, he said, look, we did what we could, it's over. I mean, this is not a man for whom empathy is natural yeah. or even sentiment of any kind. Do not underestimate what he is capable of. Now, does that mean that the, you know, Russia today, very simple fact, the Soviet Union had an economy at one time that was effectively a third of the United States. Russia, which is only one of the, you know, 
has an economy one fifteenth the size of the United States, and most of it comes from oil and resources. So, as an economic force, it's powerful only because it has a military capacity in those bombs. And I think we have to take them seriously. But to compare them with China, China is a, a you know much bigger, much more formidable country with much more in the way of energy and resources. Russia, in many ways, has a you know has has a has a strong nationalist fervor in its in the Kremlin, and not a whole hell of a lot else. Yeah, and and. I, you know, there's a couple of books that have been published. Um, one was called China Inc. and the other was about India um, that talked about, you know, who was going to beat out whom in that rise in Asia. But, you know, you just trying to get stuff done. Well, I, you know, I, I, my qualifications on China come down to the fact that my son, Evan, uh, was there for eight years for the New York Chicago Tribune. New Yorker wrote a book called "Age of Ambition." An incredible book. It had a great title for what China has and has become, and won the National Book Award for nonfiction. Um, and Evan, uh, you know, just in a, in a sentence, Evan's view is the China that he saw when he was there from 2000, basically seven six to 2014, was that this was a country on the rise. And there was an awful lot going on with it. You see there now is a country that's achieved greatness, but it's also much more repressive than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's, and, the, the, and the danger of it, which I think everybody now recognizes, is that they have a fantastically successful economy and they're authoritarian. Capitalism of a certain kind that's nasty, nastier than ever ours was because it's authoritarian political. And I think that's the danger. Russia, I always thought, look, in Russia, we used to, you know, there was a, a, the elevator in the building that we lived in was always under repair, <laughs> you know? And I always said, I said, the Russians, you know, they pretend they're not as strong as they would like to be, but they are very good at pretending they are, and they have all those damn weapons. And they have the history of having beaten the Nazis, and they've never forgotten it. Yeah that they were in a position where they could have been destroyed and they weren't. Yeah. And they live on that to this day. It's not about communism anymore. It's about yeah. Russia. Yeah, well, we could, we could spend a whole hour or a day just going over that, but I wanna make sure we get to a couple of other things. So you have this very distinguished career um, as at the Washington Post, and then you, up and leave, as you said earlier, Bob Bernstein, who was then the head of Random House, uh, recruited you and you, you had a great distinguished career there and we could spend time on that, but you then left there and you began public affairs. And I, I remember that time very distinctly, you and I were very good friends and in touch and your goal there was to independently publish uh, serious books about politics and history and current affairs. Yet the first book you published, my dear Peter Osnos, was the raunchiest public document uh, that was in ever America. published. So how, how, how did you like veer off course so quickly? Well, I wouldn't call it veering off course. I would call it I, opportunity. I might call it opportunity. Well, uh, the answer to that question is very simple. I had developed as a subspecialty when I was at Random House, what I called rabbits, books you pulled out of hats, which were mostly public documents, which was before when you, you, know, you couldn't really download things easily and you know, so on. So you could take, I did the Clinton healthcare plan as a book and sold hundreds of thousands of copies because that was how people were able to read the details of the plan. Right. So I had a reputation for doing that. And when we got to public affairs and we were getting ready to publish our first books, first one was, you know, autobiography of Martha Lyman, the great lawyer. Sitting in the little conference room one day, I get a call from the Wall Street Journal saying, look, the Star Report's coming out on Friday. I know you like to do these kinds of things. Would you be doing it? I said, of course. Why wouldn't I? And five days later, we did it. 
Uh, we nobody at that point first nobody else wanted to do it uh, because they said it's not worth it, and we did. Other publishers did in the end. How many and copies did you sell? Two hundred thousand. Yeah, two hundred thousand. And the thing I didn't know at the time, we we, we got the disc on Friday because um, he still did these things through discs. Yeah. And we got the disc of that and the Washington Post coverage of the first day. A couple of my colleagues went down to Virginia. They gave the disc to the printer. We started printing the books overnight. On Saturday, we started shipping them. I, what I didn't know is that my salespeople were shipping them by air. If the book hadn't worked, I'd be dead. <laughs> but they yeah. landed Monday and Tuesday, and it went to number one. And what it did was it led to a, a wonderful, funny feature in the New York Times about how we published this, you know, serious publisher starts off with, with this bodice rip. You were off and running. We were. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, my feeling about that, Roxanne, and I, I think anybody who is in our kind of more or less borderline work, uh, it, it was opportunity. It was an accident. But what it proved to me that it was slightly destined to happen, the, you know, that, that it meant that there was a way in which we, this little publisher, we were called yeah. Fletcher. Could punch above your weight. I would, if we did things, I used to say is that we weren't different, we weren't necessary. And this is a Connecticut story, actually. One of the books that, one of the very first books we did was, was called Blind Man's Bluff about mm -hmm. submarine espionage between the US and the Soviet Union. And it had been rejected by Simon & Schuster because it was late. The agent tossed it to us for $20,000. We published it. And on C-SPAN, I saw up at the, in, at the you know, in, in Norwich, or I mean, uh, Mystic, these submariners buying five books at a time at a mm -hmm. sign. And I said, we've got something here. 400,000 copies. Completely wow. unplanned, unexpected. Mm -hmm. And what you have to believe on some level, if you got away with the Star Report and you sold 400,000 copies of Blind Something was going on here. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, you know, amazingly 20, almost 24 years ago. There were people that we had a little thing the other night of the public affairs staff. And as I said, there were people there who work at public affairs who weren't born when we started the company. Yeah. So, Peter, I want to get, we only have about uh, 10 minutes left. And there's a, I, you know, I have, we're not going to get to everything, but Two of the two of the things I want to I want to get to is, given that there is no longer seems to be a consensus about the truth. Um, how can journalism serve to reunite us? And sort of a companion to that is because I hear increasing comments like this that is there in fact a bias even sneaking into the stalwarts of journalism like the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? Uh, where do you see all this going? I mean, you're, even as a publisher, you're a journalist. Well, I, that's what I am primarily. I would tell you that, first of all, I think many of these themes that we talk about as modern I've been around in one form or another, really, in this country. Yellow journalism, racism. Yeah. I mean, it's just that one of the things that's especially clear now is that everything is so visible. Everything magnified. is magnified. If I said something wrong on this conversation, it could be everywhere tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That was never the case before. Um, you, you, you now, everything is magnified through social media and, and cable television and so on. Where I come and I'll say something very specifically about truth, which is I believe in it, but that's not the point. What is that if, 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 if when Mike Pence would come to me, if he came to me with his memoir of his time as vice president, and Simon and Schuster is doing that book and is paying him a lot of money for it. What I would say to Mr. Pence, to Vice President, is I will publish your book, but you better meet the same standards of quality, integrity, in a pompous word, verisimilitude, as every other book I publish. In other words, I would expect what you write to meet my standards. Mm -hmm. 
worse. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. And the second thing I would say was, Mr. Vice President, you will get every single penny that your book earns, but I'm not going to give you tons of money just to do it. So the mistake I think people are making is- Wait, I, want, I, just, I, I just want to ask something about that. But if you're going to hold him to the level of truth, why shouldn't he get the same deal as someone whose point of view you might agree with? That's not the way I think about it. Okay. I, I, my view about politics, I don't think just because you're in public service, you have a pay debt. Look, okay. I, th I, I think that I make an exception. You say, well, you, know, you would for Barack Obama. The truth of the matter is Barack Obama's a writer. He writes the book. Jimmy Carter's a writer. He writes the book. Mike Pence is not going to write that book. It's going to be <laughs> written by a staff. And that offends me. It offends me that just because you have, you know, a public identity that you can make, in this case, $2 million just for showing up. That's, you know, and I've, this is one of my Don Quixote things. I, I would like very much not to see that happen. I say about Barack, if he was an athlete at the level that he is a writer, he'd make tons of money. He deserves to make money on his books. Yeah. So many of these people just, they just think because they've got 15 minutes in the limelight that some publisher should give them a great deal of money and not expect them to deliver a book at the standards that a good publisher should expect. And so they are, they, the ton of books that were published, and I have to say, you know, and some of these right-wing houses that were just screeds with no real thought. And if it was on the left, I'd feel just as strongly. Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, there's not as many of them. What I'm, what I, what I'm most curious about is, do you feel worried about journalism? Are you um, optimistic that this is an ebb and a flow that's always existed over time in journalism, and even the presence of social media won't stop the flow of the role of journalists? I, I no, I really, I am you know, optimistic. Is maybe not the right word. I'm experienced. I think that we, there are certain things that are absolutely required, eternal, necessary. S news, storytelling, the ability to inform and communicate. And you know, you go back to the beginning of time, cave paintings. What's happened is that the, it, the content is an eternal reality. What changes is distribution. And what's happened in the last 25 years is that the distribution model of the traditional print newspaper has been replaced by the digital age. And the print newspaper obviously is on a, is on a decline. But the truth is that if you ask you know, young people like the folks who work for you and so on, many of them will tell you that their favorite way of getting information these days is podcasts. And what I say about podcasts, podcasts is radio. Yeah, of course. You know, you know anal as anal as, as as a as a you know origin a broadcast. It was the beginning, and here it is, podcasts. I believe that the distribution model changes. Content is constantly in a battle with political forces. I do think social media is a unique challenge, and again, remember. And should social media. Peter, should social media be held to journalistic standards? I think we're going to evolve. You know, remember the iPhone, which everybody carries around and uses as a standard method of getting information, first appeared in 2007. It's basically yesterday. It's so brand new. And therefore, and it was in many cases, Apple and Facebook, these were started by college kids. Is it surprising that they didn't know <clears throat> where it was going to go and how the standards should be evolved? I think we're going to eventually come up with a way to be sure that the consumer is able to decide what's there. A final point about this. We are all, all of us, now editors in chief, we choose what we want. Mm. We no longer only get what we get, the morning paper or the evening news. We can take whatever we want from wherever we want. That's a huge civic responsibility, editor-in-chief.
And I think that is one of the things that's really different is how do we enable people, if they're the editor in chief, to get enough of the greater context of information to have real opinions. And I don't think we figured that one out yet. Remember this, Fox News, very powerful. But the nightly audience for Fox News is maybe three to four million people in a country of 330 million people. They don't own the country. There are an awful lot of people who they don't own. And just to tell you that when public affairs started, my notion was we're gonna do books for about 10% of the country. The people who listen to public radio, watch PBS, read the New Yorker and so forth. If I thought that I could reach 330 million people, it would be a different business. Yeah. So as, a, as an independent bookseller, you're dealing with a certain audience and you need to have a business model that suits that audience. And yeah. that was what we said about public affairs. And I believe that there will always be a premium quality information universe. We pay a thousand dollars a year now for the print New York Times. And if they raised it to 1500, I'd probably pay it. But I'm, yeah, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a dinosaur in that sense. Yeah. So Peter, you know, uh... I have like six major questions left and we won't get to them, but he, here's probably, um, well, maybe it's an easy one. Journalism and publishing has been transformed as we've been talking about in the years since you started your career in 1965. So if Peter Osnos um, was starting a career in 2021 and had all the attributes that you had in 1965. Would he be able to have the same arc and intensity and breadth of a career that you've had? Well, that, you know, I, it's almost impossible to answer the question. I'll say this, that what I've come to believe is that you have certain skills. Those are the skills that either you are born with or you develop. And the way your career evolves depends on how you manage those skills. How you're, I mean, one of the reasons why, when I look back on it now, which I'm allowed to do because I'm at this stage in life, one of the things I realized is that one thing I was always able to do as an observer, as a reporter, was something that was just inherent in the way I approached things. And I think if you come to journalism with curiosity and tenacity and an acceptance of the fact that you probably won't get rich, you can do it in today's world as long as you adapt to the way things are done now. Mm -hmm. It used to be that the newspaper came out every morning. The Washington Post where I worked for 18 years is 24 seven. It's read by millions of people around the world instead of a few hundred thousand people in Washington. Yeah. It's a different universe and it requires different skills, technical skills, the curiosity, the ability to sort of look at things and make judgments about them. I think that's eternal in the same way, you know, it's an instinct. And I believe that if you have the instinct and you want to ask the questions, you'll get there. I think journalism mm -hmm still a remarkable way to make a living. And publishing, you know, my next standard line about publishing is that the first book was in print was Gutenberg's Bible in 1550, and the second book was called Publishing is Dead. And one thing publishing is not publishing. <laughs> We've done really well in the digital age because we never had advertising, we didn't lose it. And even in the pandemic, somehow, it wasn't great. We wish it hadn't happened. But even in the pandemic, we managed somehow. So. Yeah, optimism. Right. We're going to move. We're going to move to this last question. You're an accomplished man of 77 years old. You have 90 seconds to tell me three things you know for sure. Well, I know for sure that you ought to. Well, number one, when things happen around you and you don't know they're affecting you, don't be misled. They're mm -hmm. affecting, you. and you might deflect them, but they're there. Understand that the intensity of things happening, a stress in particular, is somewhere in your persona, number one. Number two, well, I can't really emphasize this more than anything else. You can marry, choose the right one. <laughs> in my case, 50 years. So, and the Me family. Too. 
Some of them may be on this. Some of them may be on this. Well, choose the right family. That would be the, the second thing. And the third thing is make Roxanne Cody your friend because she'll have you <laughs> fun. <laughs> and you'll have a very good time. Well, Peter, we did not get to a gazillion interesting uh, topics that are, are in the book. And folks are just going to have to read the book. They're just going well, ha to so. have to do that. And Peter, I want to uh, take thank you for taking the time to be in conversation for your role in publishing and uh, to you, if, you know, I am always grateful for the personal friendship uh, to me when I was starting out in book selling and uh, certainly to RJ Julia. So, you know, bravo on the book, bravo on an extraordinary uh, career. And I can't wait to see you in person. You will. All right. Be well, Peter. Say hi to Barbara. All righty. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody, for joining us. Take care. Bye.